All right, this is uh, Domenico Composto, and I'm just going to go over one of the macro graphs that you will need to know for IB economics. And here we'll be using the monetarist model. So we just want to be aware that we're using the monetarist, which is also known as the new classical. And this is a model that you'll be using throughout the macroeconomic course. It's one of two, the Keynesian and the monetarist. So today, uh, we're just going to go over um, the creation and elimination of a deflationary gap. So we will be creating and eliminating a deflationary Yeah. Okay. So that's all we'll be doing today. So in this model, we got to have our X and Y axis. And on the X axis, we'll be measuring real GDP, the amount of output within the nation, which is measured through spending, which in theory is equal to income in a closed model. And on the Y axis, we're measuring the price level or the average price of goods and services in an economy. We have our upward sloping short run aggregate supply curve. We'll label that SRAS1. And we will have our downward sloping aggregate demand curve labeled AD1. And the intersection will have that intersect also with our long run aggregate supply curve comes down here. Now this is our starting point. When we sit down to draw this, we'll first draw the aggregate demand curve intersecting with the short run aggregate supply curve, also intersecting with the long run aggregate supply curve. And the intersection will provide, in this case, a level of output or production within the economy at full potential. We'll call that YP, Y being income equal to spending equal to the value of output, and P for the potential. So in an economy, over a long period of time, economists collect data to measure the amount of productivity that's produced on average over long periods of time where we've used full, we've achieved full employment. That intersection also provides price level at PL1. So we'll label that point A. So we can see we're at point A. So we will now assume that there's been some type of decrease in aggregate demand. Using a more recent example, we can talk about COVID, the pandemic, the lockdown, people being mandated to stay at home, which has reduced their ability to go out and spend. So since aggregate demand is equal to real GDP, which is equal to C plus I plus G plus net exports, we're going to assume that during the lockdown, because people are stuck at home, they're not able to go out and spend. So consumption spending is falling. Um, in addition, we'll assume that investment spending is falling because as people are not able to spend, firms are not selling or making revenue. That will cause their business confidence to go down. They will not uh, take on loans to invest into the economy. Um, and so we'll just assume C and I are both decreasing. Government spending is probably increasing as the government spending money on welfare, trying to inject funds into the economy to get the economy going. But we'll just assume that the C plus I is greater than the government spending. So what happens? Consumption spending falls as long as and investment spending. So aggregate demand decreases to A, D, 2. So now we're at point B. We can see that the price level has fallen. So prices of goods and services are falling. And we also see that the amount of output has decreased. People aren't buying as much, so firms are reducing the quantity of aggregate supply. So the economy, real GDP, has fallen into a recession. So why for recession? So we'll notice that as the price level has fallen, as a result of a decrease in aggregate demand, the quantity of aggregate supply is decreasing. So firms are going to reduce the quantity of supply due to the fall in aggregate demand. And as they do that, they're going to begin to fire resources, in this case, labor. They're going to have to begin to lay off people, labor, 
and perhaps other factors of production, land, capital, to meet aggregate demand at point D. So there's a rise in unemployment, which is what we expect in a recession as aggregate demand falls, which is the case. In the Matras model, they assume that there is no government intervention. This was a model that was dominant in the 1800s, part of the free market capitalist ideology of that time. Government was not required or expected to intervene. And so the economy was expected to just take care of itself. So what happens? So when you have high unemployment and there is there are no unemployment benefits because the government is not intervening, there are no other social safety nets to capture the increased unemployed labor, we would expect people to be willing to work for less money in their desperation. So wages potentially falling, perhaps even rent for land falling or interest for capital to fall. These are all costs to the firm. So if wages begins to fall, rent or interest, potentially profit falling, these costs to the firm begins to decrease. So SRAS shifts out or downward. So it slowly begins to, we'll use another color, shift out as the cost of production fall. Firms are beginning to see that labor resources are cheap. Perhaps they fired a worker for $100 a week. Now that worker is willing to work for $50 a week. They employ that worker again, but at a lower wage. So cost of production all fall to SRAS 2. And we go from A to B now to point C. And again, we notice that the price level continues to fall to PL3. Because of the fall in costs of production, prices of goods and services on average are falling from PL2 to PL3. So that encourages consumption. The quantity of aggregate demand begins to increase along the AD curve because the prices of goods and services have fallen. And we see we end up at point C where people are now being re-employed at a lower wage. So unemployment has fallen. Factors of production are re-employed all at lower costs of production and the economy is back to full employment. So we have seen a deflation price level falling from PL1 to PL3. We've seen the economy fall from full potential to recession back to full potential. All right, so that's how this graph would be drawn. So let's analyze it step by step. So as can be seen, we have a graph illustrating a national economy, perhaps the United States. We're using the monetarist new classical model. And on the x-axis, we're measuring real GDP. And on the y-axis, we're measuring the price level or the price of goods and services on average within the economy. We have a downward sloping aggregate demand curve labeled AD1 which is equal to consumption spending plus investment spending plus government spending plus net exports. And it is downward sloping as a result of the wealth effect or the interest rate effect or the international uh, trade effect. Now we have an upward sloping short run aggregate supply curve labeled SRAS1. Upward sloping because we will assume that as the price level rises, the profit margins for companies increases, so they're willing to increase the quantity supplied. And it also, uh, AD1 equals to SRS1, which is equal to LRS1. They intersect at point A. That establishes an equilibrium level of output at YP. At YP, we're assuming full potential GDP and full employment. So in the United States, that could potentially be about 5% unemployment, which is the average rate of unemployment over decades in the United States, and the price level being set at PL1. Then what happens? COVID hits. Uh, governments mandate that people stay at home. People are at home. They're not allowed to go out and spend. And so we see that the level of consumption spending begins to fall. Consumer confidence begins to fall as households are worried if their spouse or themselves will be fired from, from their jobs. As a result of the fall in consumption spending, revenue for the firms falls, so business confidence goes down, and with it, investment spending. So since C and I are determinants of AD, aggregate demand falls from 81 to 82. So where 82 equals SRS1, it establishes a new equilibrium at point B, with the price level falling to PL2, prices of goods and services on average falling, 
and the output decreasing from YP to Y recession. Since there's a fall in aggregate demand, the quantity of aggregate supply begins to decrease. Firms respond by decreasing the quantity supplied, and as they decrease the quantity supplied, they don't need to maintain the same number of labor, land, and capital, so they begin to fire labor, perhaps some capital, perhaps some land. And that leads to unemployed factors of production or resources in the economy. So the unemployment rate is now rising in the United States to perhaps 10%, which is a signal that the economy is now in recession. And that intersection, again, 82 SRS1, provides a lower price level at PL2. So since this is the Matras model, we assume no government intervention. There is no welfare. There are no pensions. There are no social safety nets for the rising unemployed labor resources, land resources, etc. So households now in the desperation of the recession will be willing to offer their resources at lower prices. So we start to see that wages begin to fall, perhaps rent or land. Not all factors of production were in the short run, so we're going to assume that at least one of the factors of production's price is fixed, but perhaps one, two, or three of the others are falling in this case. So as labor begins to fall, cost of production for firms also begins to fall. They can rehire the same employee that they just fired and offer a lower wage. I was offering you $100, now I'll pay you $50. They take the job, cost of production decreases. So SRAS1 shifts out to SRAS2. And now we set a new equilibrium at SRAS2 equals 82. At point C, the price level again falls to PL3. But because resources are cheap, firms begin to rehire and the level of unemployed resources decreases, in this case of labor from 10% to 5%. As the price level has fallen, we notice that the quantity of aggregate demand increases from point B to C or from Y recession back to YP and we're back at full employment and full potential GDP. So that is what we would do on an exam for the IB to illustrate the creation and elimination of the deflationary gap.